I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Carlo Rovelli is one of the most amazing writers and beautiful writers of physics that I have ever read and I've ever met. He's written a book, Helgoland, which is about the whole history of the quantum mechanics revolution. And I think, honestly, during this podcast, we created a unified theory which unified classical physics with quantum mechanics. You guys can decide. One thing I thought was interesting about his last book, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, or actually this was two books ago, it was such a well-written book about the deep questions of science that it actually outsold Fifty Shades of Grey in Italy, which is a, certainly an amazing accomplishment that a book about physics would outsell a, a book, uh, the highest selling soft pornography book in history. But I learned so much in this podcast and from reading his book about, I've never really understood what quantum mechanics is and what the issues were. And now I have a much tighter grasp of it. Here's Carlo Rovelli, one of the most prominent writers and physicists of this generation. Carlo Rovelli, and I'll do an intro later, but first thing I want to say, you wrote this great book, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, several years ago, and now you have a new book out, Helgoland, which um, is all about quantum mechanics and in particular your your specific theories of quantum mechanics, but you start off with the entire history of quantum mechanics and in fact how um, Heisenberg was on, I think it was Heisenberg was on a, a country that I never heard of or an island I never heard of, Helgoland, I was wondering what Helgoland referred to until you started talking about it in the book, but that's essentially this basically now destroyed island that quantum mechanics started and also the place, I guess, where uh, the Allies detonated all of their leftover explosives after World War II. That's right. <laughs> so does the island even exist anymore? It was like 3,500 tons of TNT, you said. <laughs> the, the island survived. It changed a little bit, but it survived indeed. So it's still there. There are people actually living there. It's very teeny, but you can go and visit. And it's still uh, arid, no little trees or nothing, rocks, ocean. Why did, it's very wild. Why did Heisenberg go there? And we're going to get into your fascinating theories about quantum mechanics, which finally made me understand it in a completely different way. But why did he go to Helgoland? The most trivial of reasons, because he suffered some allergy. Uh, so it was a strong ca case of allergy from you know, pollen and stuff. So he wanted to go to, his doctor told him to go to a place without trees. And that's a perfect thing, because it's, it's an island without trees in the middle of the ocean, so there's no pollen. It's very good if you suffer allergy. Uh, so that's one reason. I, I think um, it's an island full of legends. There was pirates and things like that and a pirate that uh, the young Eisenberg as a kid uh, loved. 
um, Storybrooke, something like that. Uh, so maybe that was in his mind also. But I think mostly also because he wanted to be alone and do his science, do his calculations. And it started off this huge revolution in science, which, as you point out, has is one of the few theories that is in, in science that has never been disproven at all. But we still don't know why it necessarily exists the way it does. It kind of describes the world in a very strange way, as opposed to classical physics or even Einstein's theory of relativity. But I feel like, and, and I want to I want to try to explain your book just so you could tell me if I am getting it correctly. So the idea is in, in, in quantum mechanics, there's this notion of uh, electrons or very small particles are not, don't work by the rules of classical mechanics. So if I, in classical physics by, you know, discovered by Isaac Newton, if I throw a, a baseball, the laws of physics determine the trajectory, where it's going to land, you, you know, the gra how gravity affects it, how planets orbit and so on. Whereas in quantum mechanics, this is all out the window and you can't possibly know the position and velocity of a very tiny particle uh, until you observe it. Before then, it could be anything. And, exactly. And, but then what you explain, which is very fascinating, and I never thought of this, is, is that it's not because it's in multiple states at the same time, but it's because it, we all observe, it's all, rel every object in the universe, even tiny, tiny particles, are all known or measured relative to something else. So like, let's say you and I are standing in front of a tree. You will perceive it in a different way than I will. Which tree is real, your tree or my tree? They're both real. So it's in, in the same way, small particles act the same way. They, they change depending on how they are observed and who observes them. Exactly. Yeah, well, it's great synthesis of the main idea. Very, 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 very good and very clear. And, um, and, and I have one further question about this, uh, is that lar so they always say quantum mechanics only applies to very, very small particles, like things like electrons or quarks or whatever, and not big uh, objects like, like a human or a tree or a house. And, and I, your book made me think that actually they're all, it, it, it's the same thing actually, because obviously many things are observing you all the whole universe around you is observing you. So there's a bil billions of things potentially observing who you are. So that's why quantum mechanics doesn't quite like, it's not like you're in two multiple states at the same time because billions of objects around you are observing you. Whereas electrons in a sense are very lonely. <laughs> Nothing's observing them. Oh, well, that's a very good way of putting it. I like it. I'm going to use this metaphor. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome to it. I was thinking that, that, that you would appreciate that, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but they, be, they become quantum mechanically, obviously quantum mechanically, because they're very lonely. <laughs> yes, and so maybe quant, quant, the science of quantum mechanics itself applies to small particles because there's nothing around them. There's like electrons are basically, you know, an atom is mostly like 99.9% .9 empty other than these electrons that are very, very tiny orbiting around it. But... But help me understand from the beginning, because it is so strange, quantum mechanics. And you even refer to the fact, I think it was Niels Bohr who says, anyone who understands quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. It was fine, man. Yeah, yeah. If you think, you, nobody understands quantum mechanics, essentially, he said, yeah. So, so, so what, what is it really? Like, what, what, the, what, is, what is it? Why is it so strange? Well, it's, I think you, you, you made a great synthesis. Uh, somehow, the, the old way we had uh, uh, of describing nature and the objects that uh, push it and pulled by forces, and we, we describe how they move. Every moment we say where they are and, and what their color, what their shape, what their orientation, their energy, whatever you want. Uh, it just doesn't work anymore for, for small things. Uh, people tried and tried and tried. It doesn't work. And then Heisenberg on this island came out just, you know, sort of out of the blue, trying to solve how the electron move along the atoms with a strange calculus and uh, which uh, works the way you say. It doesn't describe how the electron is. It describes how uh, it affects something else, how it interacts with something else. And so that works. So it's like nature is not a lot of things separated alone, but it's, it's how things affect one another. So it's not just how I observe it or you observe it, it's that 
how anything else interact with it. But the point is that, uh, um, as you're saying, the electron with respect to one thing and the spectrum with respect, with respect to the other thing don't necessarily agree. So we cannot just say the electron is like this or like that. And for big things, you said it very clearly, for big things like a tree, it's true that there is a tree with respect to me, a tree with respect to you. But, you know, the distinction is so small that we don't see it. It's, a, it's just quantum thing. It's, it's a teeny, it, teeny, teeny discrepancy. It seems like the larger something is, the more objectively real it is in the way we understand re reality. Yeah, the larger something is, the more uh, objectively real it is in the way we understand re reality. What matters is not size. Uh, or weight, uh, what matters really is the number of components it has. Say it, roughly the number of atoms is, is made. The physicists say the number of degrees of freedom. Because there are so many little, little things moving. In, an, in a tree, there are, you know, zillions and zillions of atoms moving around, interacting. Um, so, in, in, and we don't see the details, we only see the tree. So the discrepancy between your picture and my picture is lost in this uh, uh, approximate picture of the tree. So we come up with a common we don't have we don't have to say the tree with respect to you or the tree with respect to me. We just say the tree is there, is brown, is is tall, twenty meters, whatever. Uh, period. Um, but if we could measure things extremely precisely, uh, either the tree, because everything is quantum mechanical, ultimately, uh, we we will find out that there is no way to give a, a, a clean cut Newtonian complete description of 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 the tree because it then, when you go into the tree, breaks up in the tree respect to me, the tree respect to you, or the tree respect to the other tree next to it, which it touches. So, so you, so, so explain then what, like, why is it that we can't really observe the location and I guess velocity of an electron without changing it, right? At the same time, is it, is it because of our, and you explain this in the book, but it, but I was always kind of, dumbfounded by the fact that does our ability to observe something change it, which is what I originally thought quantum mechanics was until I read your book. Um, it is true that when you, observe, when you observe something, we change it. Because the only way to observe something is to interact with it. And uh, uh, to, 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 to exchange some energy in a sense with it. So you're disturbing something by, by observing it. But somehow... There was a time in which, uh, uh, in fact, early in the 30s, in which people thought that that's it. Um, what only what quantum mechanics tell us is only the fact that uh, since there is a sort of granularity, you cannot have a super delicate thing, fingers to touch things without, um, without disturbing them uh, because, uh, because you cannot do things arbitrarily delicately. But that's not sufficient. That doesn't uh, suffice to explain what happened in quantum theory because it's more radical. You know, it's, a, it's really that things have no qualities by themselves. They only have qualities in interacting with something else. And if you try to, to, to ass assign qualities when they're not interacting, uh, you just get to funny contradictions. It just doesn't work. The quintessential thing is that, you know, let's go back to the the small things, the, the ones which are lonely. <laughs> so they behave more quantum mechanically because they have less things to interact. And, and think of an electron. Uh, one of the funniest uh, behavior of the electron is that if you have a wall with two, two, two doors, two holes, and the electron goes from one room to the other room, uh, you, can, you can compute how it goes. I mean, in physics, you can write equations and you say it goes here and arrives here in this time, at this place exactly, okay? But then you have to ask, uh, you say, I see it here, and I, then I see it the other side, which holes it went through. And then it's something absolutely strange, because if you assume it went through one hole, okay, you get some conclusion. If you assume you get to the other hole, you get another conclusion, but neither things are done by the electron. It's like it goes through both holes. Hmm. So what, what you do in the, in the mathematics is this thing of using waves. So you think of the electron is a little ball, and then it opens up in a sort of waves, it goes through both holes. And then you say, ah, oh, I have understood, the electron is a wave. No, it's not a wave, because when you see, you don't see a wave, you just see a particle in one point. But the actual electron is only when you saw it here or when you saw there, or when you interacted with something here, and when you hit the, hit the screen there. In between, it doesn't have a position by itself. 
It's everywhere. And why is that? Well, you should ask God, not me, this. I mean, that's the way he or she or him or whoever or not or nobody <laughs> put out things. We, we, we little humans, we little creatures uh, with limited intelligence, the only thing we can do is to look around and say, wow, wow, that's the way they are. That's the way nature is. And so in the book, you describe uh, quantum entanglement, you know, which is this idea that if you take kind of the exact two twin particles that are exactly the same and they start off at the same point and you send them off in different directions at the speed of light or whatever, and then you observe one of them, the other faster than the speed of light will change because you observed the first one. And what's happening there? Because you describe in the in the book, and then this is the one part of the book I had a little difficulty with, but, but describe what's happening with enta quantum entanglement. It's not an easy phenomenon, quantum entanglement. It's a tricky phenomenon. And uh, that's why I don't, I don't describe it at the beginning of the book. I wait b b before putting up other ideas to, to, to try to explain it. It's, it's very tricky. Because uh, it's, as, as you say, quantum entanglement is, is the fact that two, two different objects, when they're separated, there's a sort of relation between them. But that relation is not easy. You see, um, the usual thing we say is that, you know, if, if, you, if you look at one uh, instantaneously, you know something about the other. But that's, that's trivial. You know? if, you, if I send two globes, uh, one to you and one in Beijing, uh, you know, my two gloves, and you open the box and you see the right gloves, you immediately know that the one in Beijing is, 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 the, is, is the left one. So, all right, so you learn something far away by looking something here. But the point is that it's more subtle because uh, uh, quantum theory allows the globe that you receive to be neither right nor left, like the electron that goes neither through one, one hole nor through the other hole. So in some sense, the globe that you receive is a quantum object doesn't know if it is right or left, it's both. And the funny thing is that, all right, so you, 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 when it interacts with you, it sort of becomes right and left, but the other one, the other side, uh, decides consistently. So if you see right, the other is left, and see rest the other in life. So how do they talk to one another? It's, do they communicate instantaneously? At the beginning, people thought, okay, they communicate instantaneously. Quantum mechanics tell us uh, that there is sort of faster than light communication from two things uh, far away. So they, somebody in the US uh, deposited a, a patent at the patent office uh, for faster than light communication in the 40s as a war. It was very, very useful to have faster than light communication. But it doesn't work. You cannot use this to send messages. In fact, there were theorems later on based on quantum mechanics say, no, 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 they do not really uh, communicate to one another, the, the, the two entangled quantum systems, something else which is going on. And what is going on is subtle. You see, uh, if you are here and you open your quantum glove, for you, on the other side, nothing has happened. To check that they're consistent, you have to wait for some information to get to you. It's only when the information gets to you that but, but it takes time to get to you. It's only at that point uh, that with respect to you, the reality of the other globe becomes determined. So the key is not that they're talking to one another instantaneously. The key is that uh, reality is relative. So what happened there it's not true with respect to you until the information gets to you. So, so in a communication sense, like when this guy filed patents for quantum com communication, you don't really know which side is doing the communicating until you actually talk to each other in some other way. That's right. There is no communication. There is absolutely no communication between the two sides in a very strong sense. In fact. Uh, uh, you know, because of relativity, you, you can imagine that the two sides, one happened first and the other happened second or vice versa. And, and, and the result is the same, which means it's not a signal going from one to the other or from the other to, to one. Uh, there's no signal going through, zero. In fact, if there was a signal, we could use it to send signals, but we can't. You, you, there's no way using entanglement to send signals. So um, it's something far more subtle which tell us that reality is not, you know, gloves that know if they're left or right. The reality could be that a glove doesn't know if it is rest or light. More precisely, an electron doesn't know if the spin is up or down. Uh, it's indeterminate. So, so your, your idea and theories, and, and you present them very well in this book, is that 
everything, all of reality, particularly at that small quantum level, is every measurement is relative to to other things. So we measure something speed relative to our knowledge of what speed is and how we're measuring it and and so on. So so something speed can't be known because if it's not measured, particularly at that level, it's relative to nothing. So we don't know. That's correct. And uh, uh, what things are relative to is other things, uh, not necessarily a human or a physicist or a, or a cat or, or a consciousness. Uh, uh, properties of objects are always relative to other properties of objects, which is not such a revolutionary thinking because we know we know we knew before that there were some quantities uh, which are only well understood in a relative sense. For instance, velocity. We, we always knew that velocity is relative, right? Uh, if you say, don't move, so you should have velocity zero. I mean, imagine that a, a mother is with a kid on a train and says to the kid, don't move. She does not mean that the kid should jump out of the train and not move with respect to the earth, right? She <laughs> means don't move with respect to the train. So put your velocity to zero with respect to the train, uh, which means keep a high velocity with respect to the Earth and a higher velocity with respect to the sun and higher velocity with respect to the galaxy. So nothing has a velocity by itself. Velocity, it's a property of an object that only makes sense relative to another object. And in some sense, quantum mechanics is a discovery that it's all like that. It's uh, all properties are always relative to, to between two objects, which is a shocking uh, discovery at the fundamental level of physics. I think it's unavoidable. There are, let, me, let, me, let me frame a little bit uh, better this. Quantum mechanics is strange. And uh, to make sense of it, you have to do something radical one way or the other. So there are alternatives, but they're even more radical. Like, you know, believing there are other words, uh, parallel worlds where one thing happened, and in another world, there's another you that sees something different. Even That's even more radical. So you can do even more radical things. That seemed to me the more reasonable and the less radical conclusion to make sense of quantum theory. You know, what about absolute things? Like, you know, the speed of light is supposed to be absolute. It never changes no matter... Um, although, although I guess Einstein disputes that, right? So he, he says, yes, if you measure it in terms of miles per hour, the speed of light has an absolute, or miles per second, the speed of light has an absolute measurement. But still, if I'm observing it, depending on how fast I'm moving, I'm seeing the speed of light at a different speed. And that's his roughly his theory of relativity. Quantum mechanics is not telling, oh, everything is relative, nothing is well-defined. It's very specific. The, if you have an object, an object that can move, an object that can change its properties in time, you know, but you even need an object. Um, the property of these objects are not in this object, are relative to something else. I mean, take an object, take a pen, okay? This pen is blue. Uh, in a sense, we know, what does it mean that the pen is blue? It's not a property of the pen, right? It's a property of the way the pen interacts with the light, with my eyes, with my brain. It's, it, blue is a complicated story. It's not just there. Animals don't see this blue. The, the blue, red, the yellow, is, is a, it's, it's, a, it's a human thing. Uh, uh, animals see different set of colors, less usually, so some even more. So to understand blue, you have to, to, to take into account various stories. And what is the velocity of this pen? Well, with respect to me, zero. It doesn't moving. But with respect to the sun, it's moving at 10 kilometers per second, super fast. So again, velocity is related to something else. And quantum mechanics is, is, is that uh, discovery that these properties, the things that can change, you know, velocity can change, the color can change, we paint it. These properties are, are always relative. Uh, it does not mean that in the description of the world that we have, uh, there aren't things that, as far as we know, are fixed. Uh, you know, some sense of velocity of light, maximum velocity of things is fixed, or the mass of a particle is fixed, it doesn't change. Um, Remember, science is not about get to the ultimate reality. Science is about uh, making the most credible story to understand and to manage, to deal with nature, with, with the world, with us, uh, as far as we have understood so far. 
So uh, we learn things, and we learn things which are true, right? The, the Earth is round, the Earth moves. Uh, but the point is not, uh, science is not telling us, look, uh, this is truth with a capital T. Science is telling, uh, you know, we have learned something more. And then maybe we'll learn something even more. We don't know. And so, so what does this mean philosophically and towards science, this idea that small particles are always observed relative to something else. What does this mean for classical physics? But what does this mean? It feels like this means something philosophically. And I know you even yeah. refer to in the book to there's a lot of nonsense philosophy when it comes to quantum mechanics. But for you, what does this mean? Like, how is this important to science? Yeah, there's there's a lot of nonsense, blah, 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 about quantum mechanics. That's right. Including quantum medicine, you know, quantum groups, whatever. Um, but... The, uh, the 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 boundary between science and philosophy it's not a, sh a clear cut boundary. Heisenberg, who invented quantum theory, who wrote the equations of quantum theory, was deeply influenced by philosophy. And so was Einstein, and so was Newton, and so was Maxwell, Boltzmann, all the great physicists that, uh, uh, read philosophy and uh, and. Uh, we're inspired by philosophical idea. Of course, philosophy, philosophy, science, physics is physics. Two different disciplines, but there's a continuous nourishing one another. Uh, because the philosophers want to know what we have, what scientists have learned about the world, to, to, to not to say stupid things. And the, and the scientists uh, use philosophical ideas to open the mind, to get out of habits of thinking. Yeah, that's what Heisenberg was good, succeeded. He said, uh, in fact, it's a philosopher, Ernst Mach, who, who inspired him by telling, essentially, in his writing to him, uh, don't take so seriously that matter is necessarily little stones moving through trajectories. Who knows? That is a way it has worked for thinking nature, but maybe there's a better way of thinking nature. So it, philosophy frees scientists to think more, more openly, but also philosophy provides um, um, conceptual tools for thinking, allows us to give, uh, give us uh, the tools for thinking. And uh, in the book, I talk about philosophy. I talk about the philosophers who influenced quantum mechanics, but I also talked about the philosophers who helped us and, and me to see more clearly. And uh, one of the, I have a full chapter on, on him, uh, of the extraordinary philosophers who I think is relevant here, not because he knew quantum mechanics, of obviously he did not know anything about quantum mechanics, but because he had some ideas that we can use. Uh, it's not from the Western civilization, it's from India, and is a classic, super well-known in Eastern uh, philosophy, is Nagarjuna. This is the uh, Buddhist, uh, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest thinkers, like Plato or Aristotle in the Western traditions. Uh, uh, he lived in the second century in India. And uh, he wrote a book, which I read, is extraordinary, and it has the idea, the book is centered on the idea, that you better think of reality in terms of interdependence of things and not of things by themselves. He has a very strong way of putting it. He said, uh, a thing by it itself doesn't exist. In his language, this is empty. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, period. It means it doesn't exist by itself. It exists because it interacts with the other, because it's together with the other, it's, it's, it's supported by the other, it exists in relation to the others. So there is interdependence. Uh, and he argues that very eloquently. Um, and uh, it, I think it offers, offers us uh, a, a possible metaphysics, uh, which is consistent with our understanding of quantum theory. It doesn't help us to solve, you know, compute the next laser or the next quantum device, uh, but it gives us a way of thinking of what actually we're doing when we do this calculation, this prediction, when we go in the lab and build machines with quantum theory. But what's the implications of this? Like, let's say, yes, it's true that everything can only be def be defined relative to other things. And, and, and large objects, again, appear like objective reality, not because they are, but because there are billions of things yeah. that are confirming its existence as yeah. opposed to very small things which don't have anything confirming its existence. So what, what, what are the, what's the use of this? What's the implications of this in terms of how we think about the world and our lives and, and, and have science? Well, look, <clears throat> about how we go around in our lives, nothing. 
<laughs> I wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, uh, whether or not, you know, electrons or particles, waves or, or neither. Um, but you could say the same about, you know, black holes. We, we discovered black holes were changing our lives, nothing. Um, or uh, even strong scientific discoveries, like Darwin. Darwin discovered that, you know, me and uh, uh, that rabbit which is running in, in the lawn, we have common ancestors. Well, so what? I mean, I just live my life. But these discoveries, these big discoveries, change the way we think about themselves, ourselves. You know, I think. Uh, um, uh, so, so the implications are, lo are larger. I think it change our perspective. And uh, look, one thing which I. It's not direct. It's indirect. But one thing that I find strongly related to that. Uh, is that if all things exist in relation to something else, so am I, right? So I'm not thinking of myself, you know, if I sit on, on the chair and start thinking, I don't think of myself as an entity. I am a set of relation to the other things. I think it's a better way of thinking about yourself, ourself. First of all, it's less scaring, uh, Ourself. I mean, and, and there, we are, we are, we are relations, we're physical relations, psychological relations, emotional relations, social relations, mental relations, uh, chemical relations. We're all this complicated stuff going on. Once again, uh, you know, then I go out and have a fight with my girlfriend. It doesn't, it does not, doesn't make me wise particularly or anything, but I think it, 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 it gives a, a, a little bit wiser perspective on ourselves. And it may even help in big scientific problems which are open. One, one chapter of my book, uh, at the end, uh, I ask, uh, does this story help us anyway understanding what is consciousness? What is a subjective perspective, which is one big discussion going on now in, in, in physics, in philosophy, in neurosciences, uh, in many disciplines. Uh, I think it does. Not because, again, not because uh, we are quantum stuff. Uh, there's no magic here, but because uh, we're not entities either. I mean, reality is not about little stones bouncing around. Uh, and then how, how is possible a little stone bouncing around makes my soul, okay? Well, reality is complicated. Reality is an interaction between stuff, between complicated stuff, okay? And I'm a complicated stuff interacting with the rest of reality. That's what I am. So it's less surprising that... Uh, out of physics, you can have uh, us thinking, loving, and doing all these kind of things that we do, taking decisions. Uh, it, it all makes all more coherent. Then, of course, you know, the neuroscientists have to do their job and understanding how the neuron works. The psychologists have to do their job and understanding how we, we have emotions and so on and so forth. Uh, so it doesn't solve problems directly. But I think this relational way of viewing things, uh, it's a good way of thinking about reality in general. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. 
Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You mentioned earlier black holes. So black holes are these, you know, giant, I guess, collapsed stars in in space yeah. where gravity is so intense that essentially light and even information can't escape a black yeah. hole. That's right. And so, so here's something that can't be observed. It can't be observed relative to other things because there's no information. The gravity is keeping the information inside. Does that affect... How is that related to quantum mechanics? And it might not that's, be, but it I'm just is, That's very directly related to quantum mechanics. In fact, mm. uh, my, uh, you know, my, my true job, my central job, what I've, I've been paid all my life for, um, is to study quantum gravity. So the quantum properties of black holes, the quantum property of gravitational things like, you know, gravitational waves, uh, uh, like space and time, which are, which are parts of gravity. 
so we need a way of using quantum mechanics to talk about black holes. So if we want to understand what happened inside the black hole or what happened, you know, we sort of know, we believe that black holes slowly shrink, they evaporate. This was a, the greatest uh, uh, theoretical result by Stephen Hawking. Uh, he, he realized that the black hole becomes smaller, smaller, smaller with time and then become very teeny. And then we don't know what happened because of quantum theory, once again. So we have to, we need a way to think about quantum theory of black holes, of space time. And that's, in fact, my current research in physics is all concentrated on what happens to black hole at the end of the, of the uh, black hole evaporation. Um, so the, this relational perspective about quantum mechanics, which I uh, illustrate in my book, on which I'm working, many others are working, uh, helps there because, uh, um, as you say, uh, the question, what is a black hole by itself, is not a well posed question. It's how it looks to, how it interacts with things. So there's a black hole seen from the outside, there's a black hole seen from the inside, and there's a black hole when it enters itself in this quantum phase that can be described. So all these pieces goes together, and my, my, my own work, it's an attempt to bring, you know, the equations, the mathematics, and the conceptual idea needed for doing all this together. That's why I've focused on trying to clarify the, what, what, what quantum, quantum gravity, what, what quantum mechanics is. In short, uh, I believe that what enters the black hole comes out. At the end of the day, it comes out. Uh, a black hole is not forever. Uh, it shrinks, it becomes small, and inside is a sort of a big, big uh, space uh, full of whatever came inside, and then it slowly these things leaks out. So if, it's not lost the information inside the black hole. It comes out. And so, so uh, you know, it comes out while it's, I guess you're referring to this Hawking radiation where it's very no, tiny... No, 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 no. It comes out after. So Hawking mm -hmm. radiation uh, brings out energy, but the information remains trapped inside, and uh, at the end of the operation, the black hole does not disappear. That's the model on which we're working. Uh, it, uh, it, it goes through some qu short uh, quantum transition, quantum tunneling, uh, like radiation, right? It's a quantum tunneling, something that escapes from... It, 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 classically, uh, the particle could not escape from the nucleus of the atom, but they do because of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a liberator of things. Um, so the, the quantum mechanics does the same thing to the black hole. When its throat becomes very small, there's a quantum tunnel, it sort of opens it, and it becomes a white hole. So something from which things come out. And so you have a little remnant there that stays for a very long time, not infinite, but very long, through which slowly all the information inside leaks out. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, Einstein and everybody always had a problem unifying classical mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity and all of his theories with quantum mechanics. And as Einstein famously said, and you write about in the book, he said, God does not play, uh, does not play dice. And Niels Bohr said, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> which right. I thought was very funny, but it seems like the way you're conceiving of quantum mechanics in some ways, and I hate to use the word, but in some ways unifies with notions of Einstein's theories of relativity, because he's saying that light itself is relative and you're saying that everything even these smaller objects like quarks and electrons that were not thought to follow the laws of classical mechanics the laws of classical mechanics themselves are relative to observation so could this be a bridge between classical mechanics and, and quantum mechanics the idea that both are relative yes and that's how um that's how I got interest in this direction. So this reading of uh, quantum theory, uh, which I illustrate in the book on which I'm working, many others are working, uh, it's very Einsteinian. Um, you see, what was Einstein unhappy with? He was, un you're right, he was unhappy with quantum mechanics. Even if he respected quantum mechanics and almost Heisenberg in the island of Helgoland got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of quantum mechanics. And the, the, the person who uh, proposed Heisenberg for the Nobel Prize is Einstein. So it's not mm. that Einstein thought that quantum mechanics is wrong. He just was not unhappy the way people were understanding it. But what was, he was unhappy because people were talking about the mind, right? The observation, the observer, 
And I said, well, what does nature have to know with the fact that somebody observes it? I mean, well, nature doesn't care if I look at something or not. But nature does care who interacts with whom. So it's not me, the observer. It's, you know, physical things interacting with one another. And that's a very Einsteinian notion. Einstein did the same thing with space and time, right? Relativity is exactly the fact that some properties like velocity are relative and uh, simultaneity is relative. So it's a step more in an Einsteinian direction, this relativity of properties, a strong relativity of properties. And uh, I got into this way of uh, thinking about quantum mechanics because I do quantum gravity, because uh, the, the job of my life was, has been to uh, go ahead in this effort to bring together Einstein revolution with, with quantum mechanics. And of course, not because I'm smarter than Einstein or the people of quantum mechanics, because science works cumulatively. So we build on the shoulder of giants, right? And that a lot of people, each one puts his own little brick. And then at some point, you know, the arch stays up. Ah, it works. And that's what we're hoping. Is there a way perhaps one could measure the level of relativity an object or particle has? So something is some objects are relative to many other objects yeah. and systems and yeah. other objects are are not relative to others. So, so the probabilities go, go up in terms of what positions and measurements can be done. So the larger something is, the more relative it is to other things, the less probability there is, no, no matter what measurement system you're using, the, the less yeah. probability is that there'll be unknown outcomes. Whereas the smaller something is, the fewer things it's relative to, so the more different type, different probable outcomes there are, and perhaps that's a unifying mechanism. I'm being, I'm acting really smart, but I'm not. I know nothing. So, <laughs> but yeah, there are there are ways of uh, of uh, trying to measure and quantify, uh, in a sense, the amount of quantumness, <laughs> so to say. So the amount of lack of definitiveness, uh, lack of, uh, or, or vice versa, the amount of relati relativity uh, in, in the state of things. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it requires some mathematics, and, uh, but, but there's a way of you know, defining a quantity that measure that, and, and then uh, seeing what are the... Uh, what are the, the, the actual observations that you, you, you could measure that. In fact, one of the, uh, something that happened in the very last years uh, is an experiment which has been proposed uh, in the UK uh, exactly to do that, to measure the amount of uh, uh, quantumness of gravity, of space-time itself. And uh, uh, some smart persons in, in the, in, in the UK and elsewhere, have been uh, able to guess a way of arranging things so that uh, we can see that space-time itself is quantum. So it's not defi de de definite. It's a sort of like the electron that goes to both holes at the same time. You know, so between two things is one centimeter, but also two centimeters. It's just, it, two kinds of spaces in between, a superposition between spaces, like the cat, which is Schrodinger's famous cat, which is alive and also dead. So the same can happen to space itself and to time itself. And the, the ways of measuring that this is the case, and I hope in the next years uh, those experiments will be done and will confirm that even space and time itself have these quantum properties. So it's, it seems like there's this constant battle between people saying, no science in the universe has, there's something has to be absolute. Like the universe exists in some absolute way. And then there's this other side which says, no, 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 everything, including the entire structure of space and time are relative to each other. And it seems like on one side, the, the fixed notion might be something like string theory, which says everything is composed of these strings that are exactly the same, but just vibrate at different vibrations. And that's how we objectively create the universe. Like is string theory kind of, am I describing that correctly? Again, these are all notions that are unfamiliar to me, but I just know, I know enough to be dangerous is the problem. Uh, it's, you know, I, I don't want to overplay this. Uh, perhaps a little bit, yes. Uh, even if things are more, more articulate, more vague, more complicated than that. But, uh, um, but there is in science an attitude toward the uh, you know, finding fixed points, 
stable structures uh, and an attitude sort of opposite, uh, uh, which is, science is not about that. It's a more dynamical process uh, in which uh, we don't have the, f you see, uh, there was one, one debate that went on in the last decades. The string theorists want, uh, were hoping to find the final theory. I, I was not in that bunch. Uh, I never thought that the, the, the aim of science should be the final theory. It's like, you know, uh, why a discipline should have us aim as dying? <laughs> Um, I, I don't think we are any close to a final theory. We are understanding step by step more about the world, but there's so much to be to be understood. So I think it's okay if we don't need we don't need a fixed ground. We don't need fixed object with properties. We don't need fundamental string for which everything else uh, uh, comes out. Uh, we, we can view with we can live without ground. So. That's true. In, uh, among scientists, there are those who push in one direction, among pushing the other direction. I am always being fascinated by a, a science which is more about discovery and less about knowing for sure. Hmm. Well, let's take this from the micro to the macro. What, what the the Big Bang is this theory, of course, that the universe started from some from some infinitesimal point. Yeah, something happened. There was this cosmic inflationary period for trillions of a second or nanoseconds and then galaxies formed and gases formed and all these things could it be that the the big bang itself was some something happened where what, something became relative to something else yeah. and that created a domino effect that created everything yeah look the current situation is uh, uh, i would describe it this way um, in the 30s, so uh, uh, less than a century ago, we discovered uh, uh, that the universe itself has a sort of story, okay? So it was not the same a billion years ago, or three billion years ago, it changed. And uh, uh, through a remarkable set of observations and calculations and deductions, uh, uh, which was really, is, is a really beautiful, beautiful story to tell, uh, we have reconstructed the history of the universe for uh, 14 billion years. And we're very confident because uh, things were predicted. You know, people said, well, I did a calculation. If you look, you'll see that. And then that was seen. So you, you start to believe these things. Um, so we know what happened in the past. We know with good confidence what happened in the past. And, and as you say, we know that in the past all the galaxies were much closer, more compressed, uh, and you go back in time, back in time, and there was a time which I think was enormously squeezed, enormously hot, enormously um, energetic. The density of energy was enormous. Oh, this is incredible, right? It's far outside what is inside the sun or anything like that. And, and it's true. We have confidence of that. Now, question. What happened before that? Answer. We have no idea. Okay, so it's not that we have a theory about the Big Bang. We, we, we have a confidence that we came out from there. Okay, what happened before? We don't know. And in fact, it could even be that before doesn't make any sense. We don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, one possibility is that before it makes perfectly sense. And there was a big universe that was contracting and became very, very small and bounced up. And we are the bouncing of this universe. That's a possibility. In fact, it's studied by many scientists. The other possibility is that uh, uh, literally that's the beginning of time because time is only things happening relative to one another. To ask what happened before doesn't make any sense. It's like asking what is more north than the Northern Pole? Nothing. Just not quite. It's like asking, you know, this house where you live has four rooms, describe me the fifth room. Well, there is no fifth room. So there's nothing to describe. Um, so we don't know. And to know that, we have to understand well quantum theory and we have to understand quantum gravity. So we have exactly to ask the questions which are um, discussed in my book on quantum theories and my books on quantum gravity. So the, the, the kind of things that have been my, my, my research work all my life. Uh, I think science is about being courageous to say we don't know about many things and just these are the boundary of our knowledge. They move, boundary of knowledge move fast. I mean, humankind knows much more than when I was born, incredibly more, okay? 
a lot, a lot more. When I was born, nobody really believed there were black holes. Even 20 years ago, people didn't believe there were black holes in, in science. So we keep learning step by step. And uh, I think that we'll figure out what happened at the Big Bang 14 billion years ago in, I don't know, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, you'll, you know, our kids will study that at school like we study, you know, the Washington, George Washington today. So, so uh, it, seems like, it seems like there are trends in science that have been happening, particularly since, you know, this generation of scientists has been born, or, or actually for the past several hundred years. Like, for instance, science, like our knowledge of the universe has become less human-based. So we used to think thousands of years ago that everything revolved, revolved around Earth because man's here. Then we realized, oh no, this, everything's revolving around the sun, but still every, all the other stars are revolving around the sun because man's here. Then it's like, there's these ga everything's revolving around the galaxy. Now everything's revolving around clusters of galaxies. And we go further and further out, making humans less and less important. And the other thing that's happening, which I now understand because of your book, is that we, we used to think things were fixed and you can't change the laws on things that are fixed. But now as we realize things are, you know, then there was Einstein's theory of relativity and then now there's this sort of quantum relativity that, that you're talking about. What would be the next step in that direction of all things are relative? Well, first of all, you're completely right. And uh, so we have been learning, that's our, been our experience as humankind. We have been learning that we're, more and more that we're not the center, we're not important. And we have been learning more and more that uh, things are not so fixed as we thought, uh, things are more flexible. But if you think for a while, uh, yeah, but that's, is it the story of each one of us? You know, we were born in a, I mean, at least those of us who were, uh, who were lucky in a family with uh, um, structure. When we were kids, we thought, this is it. That's the center of the world. And there are rules, you know, you go to sleep at eight, nine o'clock, I don't know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, whatever. Uh, and then you somehow grow up and discover that that's, you, 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 your mom and dad are not the center of the world. <laughs> you are not the center of the world. Uh, there are a lot of other people. And then you discover, wow, well, it's not just my country is the center of the world. There are a lot of other countries. And then there are other ideas, other languages, other way of thinking the world. So that's just knowledge, learning, coming out from our egotistic personal vision of things and to believing that what we're told were the absolute rules are the only universal ones. We learn more because that's what humans can do. They learn, they open the mind, they, they see things larger. Now you're asking what is going to be next thing that we're going to learn. I don't know. Um, of course, uh, I... There are certainly frontiers. Uh, quantum gravity is one frontier in which we're, we're working. So we're trying to understand better what is space, what is time at the light of quantum mechanics. Another beautiful frontier which is advancing today is the brain. I think we're going to understand that uh, we as thinking beings are not so much different than a tree or, or a thunderstorm or the sun. Uh, so once again, our being special will be a little bit disappointed <laughs> if we think that we have the whole soul, we are special in the universe. Uh, that's at least what many, uh, me and many of my colleagues uh, are convinced that it's a clear direction in which we're going. Uh, some people, for instance, think that there are the universes uh, similar to other ones. Well, by universe, I mean this 14 billion years expanding thing. I'm not convinced that there are the universe. I don't see strong evidence for that, but that's a possibility. I mean, what do I know? Um, you know, I could say, well, things should be this and that, and Niels Bohr could come to me and say, don't tell God what, <laughs> what to do. I mean, don't tell nature what to do. Nature has more imagination than us, no doubt. Well, well, what's the difference, for instance, between quantum gravity and gravity? Because this is obviously, this is a new formulation of gravity that's changing the way we think of it. What, what is quantum gravity? Gravity, it's uh, uh, the law that we've all a little bit studied at school for which things attract one another, things fall down, and you know, the moon and the, is attracted by the earth, the earth is attracted by the sun. And uh, the discovery of, uh, of Einstein, uh, the, the great theory of Einstein, general relativity, is the discovery that gravity has to do with the shape of space and, and, and time itself. Gravity is really the how flexible our clocks are going faster and slower and, and, and the length of being 
squeezed and stretched. The space in which we live is really like an elastic thing that can stretch. You know? And, and the, the result of the stretching, this different speed at which the clock go, is exactly the falling of object and, 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 and gravity. So Einstein has discovered that gravity is, is, is the shape of space-time, so to say. But all this ignores quantum mechanics completely. So if you want the two great discoveries of last century in physics, which are Einstein relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, and you know, my, my, my two last books, Helgoland is about quantum mechanics and the order of time, which I wrote before two couple of years ago, it's, it's about, all about relativity, essentially, uh, mostly about relativity, Einstein ideas. Um, so we have made these great steps in understanding nature, but they're really not yet uh, coherent. And uh, what is missing is understanding the quantum properties of gravity, so the quantum properties of space-time. And this is needed to understand what happened in a black hole, what happened in the early universe. Uh, today, if you study physics, and I say that in the seven brief lessons of physics, uh, if you're a student of physics and you, you, know, you follow classes at some point, you start thinking that your, your teachers are, 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 are idiots so don't talk to one another because uh, in the morning you have a general relativity class that gives you a picture of the world. In the afternoon you have a quantum mechanics or quantum for theory class gives you a completely different picture of the world. They're not coherent. They don't work together. If one is right, that is wrong. Uh, so in our current knowledge, there is a remarkable uh, gap which is to bring together these fantastic discoveries we have uh, made into something coherent. And until we do that, we don't, we're not going to know what happened 14 billion years ago. We're not going to know what happened inside the black holes and this kind of things. So we're not going to know what really space-time is because space and time are, have quantum properties that we haven't understood yet. So that's the problem of quantum gravity. So wait, so the problem of quantum gravity is, it's I still do, don't understand. Is to, do, to write a quantum theory of space-time. Or if you want, off gravity, which is the same thing. We don't have this theory yet. I have a theory, other people have other theories. There are not many. There are some theories around when, which I'm working, other people have built up together with me and other. It's called loop quantum gravity. Um, it's, a, it's a specific theory of quantum gravity. It's a tentative theory of quantum gravity because we're not sure it's correct yet. It's alternative to string theory. It doesn't need strings at all doesn't need high dimension or supersymmetry or anything like that. And it is a, it, if you want, it, using your words before, it brings together this relational aspect of quantum mechanics with the relational aspect of Einstein. Okay, so, so I should win a Nobel Prize because I'm, I'm trying to quantify how to define relative, things that are relative to each other. <laughs> That's correct. I'm going to start working on it. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so, so why did you start writing? You know, it's not common that scientists write popular science books. In fact, it's often looked down upon in in the scientific industry. Why you you've written such beautiful books and and you know the se uh, seven brief lessons on physics outsold Fifty Shades of Grey in Italy. It's an amazing thing that that people that that would happen. Uh, why do you do this? It just came by itself. I never really decided that. I started very late in life to write popular books. I had the desire of, you know, science is fantastic. It's beautiful. Once you look into it, it's just incredibly beautiful. So when you are in love with something, you want to share somehow. You want to tell people, look how good it is. Or, you know, tell people, do you want to get, take a look? It's, it's really fantastic. You know, space is not space anymore. Time is not time anymore. Things are not things anymore. Uh, reality is really different than what you thought it is. Uh, there is some beauty there, and also there is something important for for the way we look at the world. So uh, I th I started reading, uh, writing, and uh, to my surprise, um, many people are interested in in listening to that, and I. Um, I don't try, my, 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 my public is not the typical, you know, uh, science nerd who wants to know all the details about the science. It's the opposite. It's either scientists who want to look at perspective and interest ideas, or large public who just want to get the core of the idea, not all the details. So I, I have a double audience in mind, my colleagues and, uh, and the large public. Really, you know, the, 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 uh, 
the prototypical grandmother of mine who doesn't know anything and uh, you know opens a seven level so she read and said well i i see something i didn't know about that and this is uh, this is beautiful and surprising so i try to take away all the possible details and zoom on what seems to me the core idea the core thing we have discovered right we've discovered that the sun goes or the, the earth goes around the sun and rotates in itself that's you can say in one two lines you can say the greatest revolution by copernicus um of course copernicus did much more than that it's a thick book full of equations and details and arguments and blah blah but the core idea you can take it out i try to do the same for what is possible with the core idea of einstein theory of quantum mechanics and i do it of course from the perspective that seems more more comprehensible to me. I've spent my life working on these things, so I, I view things from, from a perspective of somebody who is in all these uh, questions, and I give my own perspective on these things. Well, it, and it's really interesting because this book, Helgoland, which just came out, you really, you really talk about quantum mechanics and ultimately reach your conclusions in, in a traditional arc of the hero, the, the, the journey of the hero. You have Heisenberg grappling with this very difficult problem. And then he, you know, there's a call to action, which is his first theories on quantum mechanics and his first paper. And then he meets um, his compatriots, his comrades who help him, you know, develop the theory further and are in and start spreading his message. But then he has his enemies, the people who reject <laughs> in problems, the result, the people who reject quantum mechanics and throw problems and questions in his path. And then ultimately, you know, the story, you know, the, the hero, which is kind of the, the main scientist of quantum mechanics, they come back to tell the tale. You come back and you tell the tale. So it has this great arc of the hero in the story and the history of quantum mechanics, which is why for me, someone who doesn't know anything, I'm able to learn so much just from reading this story, from, from this history of this inconceivably hard science to understand. I'm able to at least have a bullshit discussion with you about it, like as if I understand it. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a beautiful description, but it is exactly what happened. Look, this Heisenberg was 23 when he went to the island, you know, to, 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 to fight with a dragon alone there. And he had this incredible idea. And this, the, the beginning is like a romantic story in which this young kid uh, alone in a, in a windswept island, and he, he worked deep in the night and then climbs a rock and waits the sunshine to comes out. And then the theory was put together by him and Pauli and Dirac and Jordan. They were all in the 20s. They absolutely radical, revolutionary young kids. Uh, with ideas, uh, uh, the beginning theory was called um, Knaben physics in German, the, the, the boys' physics, because of boys <laughs> in the twenties, hmm. uh, and they have changed the world. I mean, do you think you think do um, a great movie on that? They have changed the way we see the world. This you should write a script for this. Someone should buy the uh, the rights to this. Is that that is a great idea? <laughs> do you think it's true that? the greatest scientific dis you have to be young to come up with a great scientific discovery. Um, most great scientists, not all. So, you know, there were some old people who <laughs> did some remarkable good people, but it's a minority. The, the, the most uh, really major ideas uh, uh, were done by scientists who were young. Uh, knowledgeable, very, very, very learned. So young kids who are immersed in a problem, but, uh, uh, but very young, Einstein was very young, also was 25 when he did the relativity. And Newton, when he got, he published later, but his main idea, he was, is he got it very early. Um, you need the courage of the youth to make uh, a big job. And they were all people who opened up the mind, right? Think about Darwin. Darwin changed our view of humankind with his, uh, his discoveries. Uh, he got on a boat and went around the world with his boat for, for, for two years, um, uh, no, meeting new people, new landscape, new everything, and realizing that you know, the world is larger and full of things and trying to put order, he came out with a, a extraordinary discoveries. Heisenberg got to this solitary island with books of philosophy, books of poetry. He was reading poetry, Goethe. Goethe love for Islam in the in uh, the poetry, the, the Eastern Western Divan book. So you need to be young, open, learned, uh, and uh, to be to do great discoveries. Of course, you know 
a lot of young, open, super intelligent kids that don't do great discoveries, but that's fine. Also. But do you think it's because of the structure of the brain when we're young, or do you think it's because when we're older, we have more responsibilities? We have, you know, mortgages to pay, kids to raise, and, and so on. Do you think it's a difference in lifestyle between the young and the old, or is it a difference in the brain between the young and the old? I don't know. If I had to guess, it's a difference in the brain. And uh, let me put it in this way. Uh, I, I'm old <laughs> in this. I'm certainly not 20. I, I'm very old with respect to that. I think old people are more stupid. Now, to be, to be fair, it's also true, like old people like to say, that they were more wise. So they know so many things that often uh, uh, they take wiser decisions. Young, young kids are notorious for taking unwise decisions. Adolescents take very unwise decisions. So um, being young is risky and you take unwise decisions. But, you know, to do science, sometimes you have to take to, to, to risk, take risks and to go where nobody else has gone. And when you go where nobody else has gone, and that's certainly something that uh, Einstein, Heisenberg, Newton did, uh, then a lot of people go in places where nobody else has gone and just get eaten by a tiger but some of them come back with a bag of gold and that it is. These are the ones we remember, the ones who've come back with a bag of gold. Well, Carlo Rovelli, author of the excellent book, Helgoland, and the subtitle is Making Sense of the Quantum Revolution. Uh, it's so informative and I, I learned so much from reading the book and then from talking to you. It's always great to have a podcast because I get to read the book and then whatever questions I have about the book, I get to have the author on, a uh, world famous scientist, and just ask whatever questions I want. And you're kind of, you feel obligated to answer them. <laughs> so it's great. I could just say the weirdest things and then you'll have to take them seriously uh, and, and answer it. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you spending your <laughs> time you. and, and uh, being nice to me and, and, and answering these questions. And I'm going to close actually, you, 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 you have a quote in the book, which is actually a quote from... Douglas Adams, which I, and I just love this quote. It comes from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And you mentioned this quote. Douglas Adams says, the fact that we live at the bottom of a deep gravity well on the surface of a gas-covered planet going around a nuclear fireball 90 million miles away and think this to be normal is obviously some indication of how skewed our perspective tends to be. And it really is all about perspective is the ultimate conclusion. And I, I appreciate this book and I'm so happy you came on the podcast so thank you so very much. And everybody should read this book, Helgoland. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a very nice conversation. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last. 